Thank you, Robert. So this work has been done at AIT Lab at ETH well, together with Anna Feit and Otmar Hilliges. So this video only plays every second time I start the presentation, so let's try it again. See? So mixed reality allows to display personalized contents anywhere and anytime and, um, and essentially with any time, um, with any arbitrary amount of information. And it complements current technologies such as desktop or smartphone computing. What we are arguing is that mixed reality is inherently context sensitive. So the interface changes every time the user changes their task or moves to a different environment. So manually designing for all those different situations or their combinations is infeasible. So context sensitivity should avoid two main problems. The first one is constant manual adaptation. So here the user is switching tasks from reading a paper to taking a break. And if the interface is distributed in 3D, they have to adjust all their applications to fit their needs. For example, uh, to, that they can see when their next train goes or to watch a YouTube video or when their food comes or news. So this they have to do every single time they switch tasks, which is tedious and cumbersome. The second problem that happens is information overload. If you would go for a trivial solution where all the information is displayed constantly all the time, that would be, in the end, pretty annoying, I believe. So the question for our research is really, how can we automatically adapt virtual contents to avoid constant manual adjustment and to not overload users? And here's an example of our approach. So here the user writes down notes in their office and experiences medium cognitive load as, an indicator, uh, as indicated in the lower left. The visibility of the virtual elements, their placement and level of detail are automatically decided by our system. They can be adjusted by the user, but they don't necessarily have to. So prior work has mostly focused on layouting of virtual elements to avoid visual clutter. For example, the work by Gall and colleagues on Flare, or the work by Bell and Grasset. Diverdi and Juliere both adjusted the amount of displayed information uh, to avoid unnecessary visual complexity or the filtered information. Also, tomorrow in the morning, I recommend going into the session where my colleague Christoph Gebhardt is going to present the reinforcement learning approach for information filtering in mixed reality. So most of these works really focused on visual complexity. What we wanted to do is that we wanted to jointly optimize an interface for users' current context. And with context here, I mean their cognitive load, their task, and their environment. So let me explain how we, uh, what we did and how we did it. So based on users' current context, we want to automatically decide on the visibility, placement, and level of detail of applications. So visibility is pretty straightforward. We want to decide, should an element be displayed or shouldn't it be displayed? For placement, our approach decides if an element should be anchored uh, in the view or in the world. So with view anchored, I mean displayed as heads up item. So, that's another one of these videos, beautiful. So we decided on this more simplistic model of placement since it allows users to exploit their spatial memory, but it could be potentially extended with an adaptive placement method. So here, the user is adjusting the position of the items in the world, and we decide on if it's in the world or as heads-up display. Thirdly, we want to decide on the level of detail of an application. So here you see an example with the email application with five levels of detail. Um, and all, all with uh, increasing uh, information from an icon to um, your last three emails. And we do this with a mix of rule-based decision-making and combinatorial optimization. So in an essence, what we want to do is, if we have an increase in cognitive load, we want to show less virtual elements based on the task and environment. To do so, we have two main inputs ones that are provided by content creators or designers, and the other ones that are measured live by the system. So the content creator provides the applications, so for example, the email application, and for each visually designed levels of detail. 
And then they also provide a cognitive cost of an element. So how cognitively expensive is it in order to display something? And then they provide a set of tasks. And for each task, they provide the utility of an element, so how useful is it, and their frequency of use, so how often is this used. Currently, this is input with a set of simple sliders, but it's easily feasible to actually have a data-driven approach to, um, to replace this manual approach here. The second part is measured by the system. So for one, we just geometrically measure are elements actually visible to users. And the second part is our cognitive load estimation. So here we build on the work by Dukovsky and colleagues on the index of pupillary activity. The index of pupillary activity, or IPA, is essentially the frequency of meaningful pupil dilations. And this is correlated, or it's, yeah, it's, it should be correlated at least, with cognitive load. So with higher frequency of meaningful pupil dilation, it, we have a higher cognitive load, and the same holds for a low cognitive load. In our approach, this could also be replaced by other methods if they are found to be more reliable. We have a three-step process in order to solve that problem, where we first decide if an element should be world-anchored or view-anchored. Secondly, we decide on its visibility and level of detail. And third, on if it's decided that it should be visible and view-anchored, we decide where it should be displayed and the heads-up display. So to decide if world or view anchored, we use our knowledge of the environment. So as you see later, we have a depth camera mounted in front. Or if you would apply this approach in VR, you have all the information you need anyways. And an element is displayed world anchored, so anchored in space, if it's visible to users. So it's in the field of view of users, and it's not occluded by geometry. The second part, and what I think is also the core of the method, method is where we decide on the visibility and level of detail. So in a nutshell, what we want to do is we want to display as many elements with the highest level of detail while not exceeding the cognitive load of users. We use integer linear programming to solve that. So what we take is the input from the content creators, where we take the utility of an element for a specific task and its frequency of use. We then use uh, combinatorial optimization that allows us to find out which elements to display and with which level of detail. So note that the trivial solution here would be to always display everything with the highest level of detail, which does not solve our second problem with information overload. So therefore, we introduce two main constraints. The first one is a cognitive load constraint. So we take the current cognitive load of users and the cognitive load of the displayed virtual elements, and we say that they should not exceed a certain threshold minus the small alpha to not max out cognitive capacity of users constantly. The second constraint is a level of detail constraint, which essentially says only de display each, uh, each application with a single um, level of detail so we don't have duplicates um, in, in our uh, virtual world. The third part is then that we place view anchored elements. So if an element should be visible and view anchored, we greedily place it in the best slots. So what do I mean by best slots? So here's an example, for example, how the Skype icon gets placed. So the best slots are essentially a, a function over the user's field of view, where we say the foveal area is of low quality so that you don't have the virtual elements constantly in front of you. The mid, sorry, the foveal area, the mid-peripheral area is of high quality, where we say this is a good balance of visibility, but also it doesn't disturb you. And the far-peripheral area is of low quality, mostly because of constraints of current uh, headsets. And once we've decided where to place it, we place them. Or if an element has been previously assigned, we put it into the same slot again to exploit spatial memory. So this is our three-step process to automatically decide when, where, and how to display virtual elements. In terms of implementation, we implemented our prototype in Unity with SteamVR, and we used the Groby solver for the linear program, for the integer program. This runs in real time at roughly 7 milliseconds for 12 elements with five levels of detail. We also, uh, in the paper, you can find the details that we checked on the, um, on the scalability of the approach, and we found that it scales linearly with the number of elements and their levels of detail. So for example, if we were to have 200 applications with four levels of detail each, 
This takes roughly 40 milliseconds for the solver to solve. Note that while this is not real time, I do not think that this is a process that should happen at 30 frames a second, but really only when there is a meaningful change in context, so task or cognitive load, for example. In terms of hardware, we use a VR headset, an HTC Vive Pro, with a set mini camera mounted in front, um, and the integrated Pupil Labs eye tracker for the cognitive load estimation. We decided on that approach since it gave us a larger field of view compared to uh, available um, AR headsets like the HoloLens One or the Magic Leap. I'm going to show you three scenarios which, which we implemented. So for the first scenario, the user is just doodling, which I would argue is a low cognitive load task and which we also measured here. And there's more information available. A lot of information is at hand, so the user has uh, all the information and, um, because they're, they can handle it in terms of cognitive load. Second is brainstorming, which was measured as a medium cognitive load activity, where we show less information that is more task relevant, for example, inspirational images or the current tasks. The last one is where we read a difficult scientific paper where we only show very minimal information to not overload users. We also evaluated our approach um, to find out about the usability and applicability. So we had 12 users that followed a dual task paradigm and they completed three different primary tasks with different cognitive loads. So counting backwards in steps of 17, which is for many people or for most people a high cognitive load task, counting backwards in steps of two, and I can search. As a secondary task, they were asked to answer questions verbally. So the system with text-to-speech asked them questions, and they, were, and they needed a couple of applications that were in the virtual room in order to answer those questions. As dependent variables, we measured primary and secondary task performance, as well as the number of interactions needed in order to answer the questions. We performed the study in VR because the setup I introduced earlier introduces a lag of roughly 60 milliseconds, which is okay for kind of testing, but it introduces a bit of motion sickness, which we were avoiding, and also it provides an even larger field of view. We tested two main conditions where the first is the manual condition. So here the user is counting backwards in steps of 17 and then gets asked a question, for example, who is your second Skype contact? They answer the question verbally, verbally which gets logged by the uh, experimenter, and then they move back to the task. In the optimized condition, our system has a rough knowledge of the tasks that the user uh, tries to achieve and then suggests the placement so that when, where, and how of the virtual elements, and users can still adapt it in order to, to uh, fulfill the secondary task. In terms of results, we found no difference between, uh, in task performance between manual and optimized. This is not unexpected. The performance is really dominated by the primary task here, um, but our system did not disturb user in fulfilling the task, which is for an adaptive system already kind of the first goal definitely. What we also found is that our method actually decreased the number of necessary interactions by 36% compared to manual, which makes us believe that this is definitely beneficial in the long term and also makes it apl applicable if you really have this context uh, adaptation. So in conclusion, we're arguing that manual design of mixed reality interfaces is not feasible because of a constantly changing context. What we are proposing is to jointly optimize mixed reality phase based on this context, and we, we provide a first implementation based on rule-based rule -based decision making and combinatorial optimization. There's still a set of open challenges. So for one, cognitive load estimation. The IPA introduces a lag of roughly 30 milliseconds, and I think that a sensor fusion approach, for example, with GSR would be a way to go that might be more reliable and also faster. Also, predictability is super important for any user interface, as probably all of you know. And also, we have mostly tested applications so that we're inspired by desktop computers and not more deeper augmentations, like, for example, what happens if I actually change the color of a physical object through HMD, uh, how would the user react to that? And also, we did not yet investigate larger co changes in context, for example, changing uh, the context from the home to the office to outside. I think this will yield a set of new and interesting challenges that will require computational approaches to make mixed reality feasible. So 
To sum it up, I think that mixed, context-aware mixed reality really balances virtual contents and the physical world to avoid overloading users and to avoid the constant manual adjustments of virtual element. So the last thing I want to say before Robert cuts me off is that on this, uh, we published our source code even with a small 2D playground for you to get started with integer programming if you're interested in that, and everything is published free on GitHub. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Let's uh, see if there's any questions uh, in the audience. All right, so I have, I have a question. Um, actually, this is about the cognitive load estimation. Uh, it seems the, so you said there was a 30 second delay on yes. the cognitive load estimation. Uh, the, the values were shifting during the, uh, the actual videos you showed. Yeah. And what's that from? So, I mean, we do constantly do the eye checking and the calculation of the IPA, but we need roughly 30, milli, uh, 30 seconds of data in, in order to compute kind of the current value. So this is where this delay is. So we have a sliding window of 30 milliseconds, and an event that has happened like 15 seconds ago um, will only kind of show up in the cognitive load estimation with, with this delay. We are currently investigating kind of if you can do it actually with 15 uh, seconds or 10 seconds, but I think especially with that method, it tends to be more noisy the shorter your window is. We're talking about a frequency of like two changes uh, uh, a second or something like that. So if you only have, have uh, five seconds, you're, you're kind of, you have a very weak signal to noise ratio here. I guess the, the values that you show here, those are all based entirely on the pupil dilation numbers. Yes, yes. That's cool. So I think really kind of some, something where you have, you combine it with GSR with stress level, for example, would really be an interesting approach, way, which is more immediate, um, and then you can find out if that actually works better or not. Thank you.